morning, Northwest. No, this isn't Northwest Community Church. <laughs> I went back in time. Who, oh, baby. <laughs> this is Heritage Bible Church. Wow, that was really strange. <laughs> Well, we're going to sing a song this morning. It's called All Hail the Power of Jesus' Name. Some of you might know it. Um, and in the words, it says, bring, f well, okay, let angels prostrate fall, which means that they fall on their faces, right? Um, and then it says, bring forth the royal diadem. Raise your hand if you know what a diadem is. All right. Okay, some of you do. So, Jim, bring forth the royal diadem. <laughs> and we're going to sing about this. <laughs> All right. We have our royal diadem on. We are ready. <laughs> I'm going to put mine next to yours. You can wear yours. You look good. <laughs> she looks good in it, so. <laughs> you can stand with us and sing. All hail the power of Jesus' name. Let angels prostrate fall. Bring forth the Oh, yeah. 
your failures, bring your addictions, come lay them down at the foot of the cross. Jesus is waiting there with open arms. For God so loved the world that he gave us his one and only son to save us forever, believes in him. We bring our failures, we bring our addictions, we lay them, we lay them down at the foot of the cross because you are the Savior. You are the one who gives us freedom. And so we release ourselves to you to be filled up with your spirit this morning and to live for you every day of the week. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Good morning. Hope you had a good Christmas time. For us, it's not over with. We have other family coming today. Maybe you have that happen. Maybe you did it a couple of weeks ago. I did learn something this Christmas. You want to learn what I learned? I learned I, learned I can make a high screeching sound. <laughs> now, I, I learned if you put a Dewar's chew in your pocket and forget about it for a couple of days... What, what happens in your pocket? It gets a, I got it out, but uh, I learned about not to do that. So um, if, uh, thank you for coming today, Heritage Bible Church uh, in Northeast Bakersfield. Not, sorry, got a net. Got to mess with the net a little bit. Anyway, thank you for coming. If you're a first-time guest, we're glad that you're here. Uh, you can join me back in the information booth in the social hall following the service, and we'll have a gift for you. And uh, there's still, uh, JD, there's still a love offering available. You want to fill out a card, drop it in the, the offering box in the back, or it's on the app as well. So we want to remember him through this year and help them out. Uh, Wednesday night activities resume this Wednesday. What about uh, no journey this what? In January. That's not this Wednesday. See, that was a test. You passed, I didn't pass, so... Okay, on January 5th, and uh, what about uh, Journey? Would that be the Monday before on the 3rd? Yes. Monday the 3rd, will Journey Group will meet. The Wednesday night activities will resume on the 5th, and there'll be uh, more information about what the women's ministry is going to be doing once they uh, figure out what kind of course they're going to follow along. We'll have an announcement about that. 
And there are, you, we don't pass the, the offering bag anymore, but you can certainly uh, give. There's an envelope in the, in the pew front, in front of you. You can drop a check in the little two boxes out there, the offering boxes, or cash in those if you want. You can also give on the app, or you can, people, some people once a month, they just mail a check to the church office, and you can see me about that if you need the address or help with that situation. There's no Heritage Kids today, uh, so we're taking a day off from that. But we also, today I want to mention about, uh, since Christmas is the season of giving, many of you uh, throughout the year and uh, have give to what we call the Koinonia Fund. Koinonia is a Greek word, which is kind of like for fellowship and helping others out was what we kind of used it as. It was called the Deacon Fund before, but we call it the Koinonia Fund. And I always think it's funny that K-O-I-N is the first part of it, which is coin, which kind of reminds me of giving. And uh, many of you give to that, and we're grateful for that. Uh, some of the things that have been used for the Koinonia Fund this year, uh, bus passes, uh, some home repairs that were needful, some help with car repairs. We don't pay for the whole car repair, but we have help with that, with that, and some tires. We have help with uh, some funeral expenses to help offset some of those as well. Gas, uh, food cards for people that need that. Uh, we've had people that had a broken car window. One of the, the school staff had a car window smashed, and they took a backpack, and we helped pay for the car window because it, you know, they, they weren't as a single mom with a child, and we need to help them in those situations. Uh, we did help with some post-surgery items. People who needed some things after they had surgery, also with food for those situations as well. And lots of rides to the doctor and the hospital and different places. I give rides to help people out with those situations as well. Also, um, many more things. But Everence, I want to put a slide up on there. Uh, Everence is, used to be called Midnight Mutual Aid, I believe, and uh, it was a way for people to help. There's different financial situations people can use to be helped. And uh, fin Everence uh, is a financial assistance plan. And what it does is it can help you with various um, things. If they have um, a free service where you can get help with budget needs, some people may need help with uh, student loans. And so it is a survival situation where you can help Survival. Maybe you're struggling and you need so we can give you some assistance through Everance that way. Maybe you're stable. Wouldn't we all like to be stable? That would be right. To, and then some people are, uh, they have a secure surplus and there's different instruments Everance uses for that. I joined the Everance Credit Union, which is an online banking situation. And so I just do, uh, I have a separate a little retirement thing goes in there. And so I use that to separate it from the household and I can use that a lot and helps keep that separated. And also they have um, a credit card called My Neighbor Credit Card, where one and a half percent of any, the, any one and a half percent of whatever you charge on that goes to a charitable organization you designate, like the church or the school. So some people want to get that, and so when they use it for various things, they know that automatically the money is donated to the school, which is a kind of nice, nice way to give that. But it's a great situation to, you, to be involved with. And if you want to, more information about that, say, I, want to, I want information about this or that to see me, that I make, I'm the church advocate. I make the connections. I don't do financial advising. And that's clear. <laughs> and, but it's a great service. And, and people have joined the credit union. People have gotten, used the, uh, the budget app to help get their budget straight away. And the first of the year, sometimes you want to do that. And it's a great, we have tools for help uh, stewardship. So if you say, I want to do some giving, we want to learn about how to do giving, and uh, that would be helpful as well. So a lot of information about that, and we have different levels of help uh, for you through Everence. So that would be great to have that. Now, we want to pray for the offering today. I want to, let's uh, just thank God for what he's done for how he's given to Everence. Thank you for all you've given, all of your gifts, and on behalf of the people who are grateful when we help them out. I am oftentimes the instrument to supply that need for them, and they're grateful, and I want to thank you on their behalf. Let's pray. God, you give the greatest gift of your son. You give him, you give us your spirit to guide us, and, and uh, praise God from whom all blessings flow, as the song said and as the word says. And we're grateful for these offerings today. We ask that you take them and multiply them. They may not seem like much. They may seem, they may seem grand. But it, it's going to your work, to your ministry, to touch lives for your good and glory. 
and we're thankful for all that you do and all that you've done for us. We thank you for the, as this year comes to a close, we pray that we can be a blessing and be a, a servant to you and honoring and glorifying your name. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I did not read my note, and it, uh, Everence does match Koinonia giving, and this year they were able to give us $1,500 to offset and match some of the gift we give. So Everence doesn't just want your, to do services for you, but they also give back to the church every year so we can help extend our service and our ministry. Thank you. Let's now stand and greet one another since the kids aren't being dismissed. So let's... I liked it. All right, well, let's gather back again. I remember what I was going to say. We have a bass guitar player this morning. <laughs> I know he doesn't want to be seen, but you know what? It just feels so good to have more instruments again. So um, anyway... Thank you, Jacob. <laughs> All right, let's sing your great name. Lost 
lost are saved find their way at the sound of your great name all condemned feel no shame at the sound of your great name every Take these hands I know they're empty But with you they can Be used for beauty In your perfect plan All I am is yours Take these feet I know they stumble you use the weak, you use the humble, so please use me. All I am is yours. 
rejoice Take this heart Set it on fire Shining in the dark I want to tell the world Of who you are All I am is yours Thank you. You may be seated. Amen. Thank you very much, worship team. I am grateful that God has raised up new worship leaders to lead us on Sunday morning. And grateful for Elise and Annette being willing to step into that role um, as J.D. Uh, is no longer with us and continues a new chapter in his life. Uh, they're excited about leading worship. Uh, you know, next week, uh, we're starting off the new year by celebrating communion. Today, we're finishing a three- or four-month series in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus' teachings in Matthew five through seven. So next week will be communion. The week after that, we start a brand new series in the book of Psalms, and it's going to be a five-month series. And uh, with the new worship leaders, they, uh, they want to uh, expand our understanding and experience of, of worship. I've been in a lot of churches where the, the leader will sit there and say, let's begin worshiping. And what, what he means by that is, now we're going to start singing. And singing is a, uh, an important part of worship, but it's only one aspect of worship. Uh, God looks at our heart, and there's many other avenues that we can express our worship, whether in silence or prayer or dancing. I don't know if we're going to begin dancing or uh, other things. But I want to I let you know, they want to help us expand our understanding and appreciation of worship. And so they asked me, they wanted to know what, I, what my sermon topics were for the next three months. Uh, so I had to work on that. Um, <laughs> but at least give them an idea so that they can begin now thinking of, of what would fit in on that Sunday when we're talking about a certain and top topic. And, and so I appreciate worship leaders like that that are going to work with me as we look ahead to the next few months. And hopefully uh, you'll be grateful for that as well. As we continue the service, I want to share some prayer needs with you. Uh, Jen Gonzalez sent me a text this morning. Uh, let me know this is really the reason there's no Heritage Kids this morning. One of her daughters woke up with what she thinks might be pink eye and did not want to risk <laughs> uh, bringing her daughter to church and, and sharing that with other children who might be here. And so 
That's the reason for that. Uh, but pray for, pray for Jen Gonzalez and her family. Uh, some of you may or may not remember that on Christmas Eve was the one-year anniversary of her father's death. And so Christmas Eve, you know, will always be a, a challenging time for her. And uh, uh, fortunately for us, uh, she came at our Christmas Eve service a couple of nights ago, and the children were very involved uh, in the service. Many of them were reading scripture, and there was a one song where the children led us in singing, Oh, Come All You Faithful. And, and I had encouraged Jen, I said, listen, you need... Uh, it would really be good if you came to the Christmas Eve service and, and bring, your, bring your family so that your children have a positive, fun experience on Christmas Eve and not just a, a sad memory of what happened a year ago. Um, and so they came and, and played a vital part in, in the service. Um, but just pray for them and pray for uh, Jen's mother and the entire family. This has got to be a... a it's a time of, of sorrow and celebration, you know, celebrating Christmas and yet remembering that on Christmas Eve, you know, her dad passed away a year ago. Um, we want to continue praying for uh, Diane Snitchler. Uh, talked with Steve earlier. On, uh, you know, several weeks ago and even months ago, she uh, was hit by a car and, and shattered many bones in her leg. And, and the healing of those bones has been very slow to occur. There really has not been much healing. And so we just really need to pray that God would begin to, to heal and bring those bones back together and, and help regain her strength and, and her health. So pray for them. Pray for the entire family uh, during this time of, uh, as they care and uh, patience and, and uh, concern. So we just want to lift them up. Okay. Um, So as we think about those needs, why don't you just join me in a word of prayer? Let me, let's lift up these needs and, and uh, just continue to, to seek the Lord as we begin to open up his word. Father, we, we thank you that during this Christmas season, we are able to celebrate the fact that God became flesh. The word of God uh, became flesh and dwelt among us. You became a baby to let us know about how we could know you in a personal relationship by you being our Savior and dying on a cross for each of us. Uh, Lord, as we celebrate that, we're, we come to the end of a year and we think of people like J.D. who uh, have now transitioned to uh, new ministry that you're going to lay out before him. We just pray that you would continue to guide and direct him. Use him for your kingdom. Thank you for his heart. Thank you for the years of faithful service that he gave to Heritage. Uh, and I just pray you'd continue to bless him and Bree in the future. Lord, we lift up those who are battling illnesses. We think of Diane Snutchler and pray that, that Lord, you would, would step in and you would help to begin to supernaturally uh, heal the bones, the broken bones in her body, that, that she could experience your healing and restoration and, and full strength. Uh, Lord, we thank, we, we, we want to lift up families that, that have heartache this morning as they think of memories. And there's other families in the church and school family who have lost loved ones recently. We think of Tammy Stormont and the loss of her mother-in-law um, and the funeral which will be happening in, in a couple of weeks. But, but Lord, there's many families that, that have hurts during this time of, of the year, whether it's the Gonzalez family or Stormonts or, or many others. Uh, as I think back on this last year and some of the, the hurt they've experienced, may you provide your comfort and your peace, give them the strength and, Give them hope as they face the future to know that you understand all of their needs and that you carry them during uh, times of, of distress and, and trials. Uh, we thank you that you never leave us, you never forsake us, but you guide us and direct us. Um, you never, you knew, you know each of our steps before we take them and said, so we commit our lives to you and just may we sense your spirit as we listen to your voice. Lord, now as we open up your word, I pray that uh, our hearts and our minds will be open to the truths and principles you want to teach us today or, or remind us about um, as we continue to follow you. We thank you for the end of this year and we commit 2022 into your hands that it would be a year that brings you uh, more honor and glory as we serve you and follow you. We pray in Christ's name. 
Amen. Okay. How many of you are football fans? Raise your hand. Any football fans in the audience? Oh, bless you. Okay. Let me ask you this question. How many of you have ever heard of the name Newt Rockney? Oh, many. Okay, good. I did a little research on, on Newt Rockney. I didn't know all about his background. The man was born in Norway. I didn't know that. Born in Norway. His family moved to America when he was five years old. They moved to the Chicago area. He grew up in that area. Uh, when he went to school, he engaged in sports. He was a star athlete in football. He loved doing that. Later on, ended up, as many of you probably know, became head coach, head football coach at Notre Dame University. Uh, and he was one of the most successful uh, football college coaches in history. He ended up being the the head football coach at Notre Dame from 1918 to 1930, uh, which unfortunately in 1930 he died in a, a plane crash, an accident there. But when he was coach, uh, he ended up, uh, interestingly enough, he, he, he won 88% of his games. Uh, he led Notre Dame to three national championships. And while he did not invent the... Uh, the forward pass, he was the one that is credited with making it most popular. And he was very successful using it, and that's what made the, the team so successful. But while he was coach at Notre Dame, I read about, there was a, a, a sports writer in town for a local newspaper who gained the reputation as being probably the meanest and most derogatory uh, sports writer in the entire country. Uh, somehow this one sports writer knew about all of the team's weaknesses and would write about the players during the football season. And he would, uh, he, every, every week in, in his column, he would point out the mistakes of individual players and mention them by name. But somehow he also wrote about players who were lazy, who broke training, who just weren't disciplined, and that you know, the players would read that and they'd just get furious. They'd get mad. And so they went to Coach Rockney and they said, said, you know, what's going on with this sports writer? You know, uh, what's he doing to us? You know, and, and, and Rockney was sympathetic and he said, listen, you know, I don't know how he's getting his information. I, I, there isn't anything I can do to, to get him to change his mind or, or not write the way he does. And, he, and Rockney said, listen, the only thing that you can do is go out and play football so well that you prove him wrong. And many of his players took that challenge and, and went ahead and, and pursued that as, as a way to deal with you know, the writings. Well, later on, as some of you imagine, it was discovered years later that Rockney was the writer of that article. And he did that purposely as a way to motivate his team to become stronger. And the, there's a parallel there for us that ties in with today's passage. God's scripture does that in our lives. Sometimes when we read scripture, it makes us feel uncomfortable. Sometimes when you read certain verses, we squirm a little bit. Sometimes we feel a little guilty. But God gives us scripture to encourage, to teach us, to rebuke us, to admonish us when we need to. Um, so that we would grow spiritually, that we would grow stronger. The book of Hebrews calls the word of God a double-edged sword, which sometimes cuts us and opens us up, you know, uh, and reveals things that, that need to be fixed. Maybe it cuts us and reveals some sickness or cancer. Um, and that, that's painful. Surgery is always painful. But the end result is, is greater health and healing. And sometimes that's what God's word does. Today, as we end our series in the Sermon on the Mount, we come to the end of, of Matthew 7. Uh, Jesus concludes his teaching in the Sermon on the Mount by talking about the power of Scripture and the power of God's Word in our lives. And so uh, today's message is entitled, Scripture, Words That Inform or Transform. And there is a sermon outline on the church app. There are copies, uh, hard copies have been passed out if you want to take notes. You know, sometimes we read the Bible to fill our minds with facts so that we are more informed about the Word of God. And that's a good start. 
All of us need to do that. Um, But God's desire is to see those facts in our mind move to our heart and have our lives transformed because of that. See if, you know, let's turn, turn with me to, to Matthew chapter 7. See if you can spot the key to, to, to that transfer, transformation, moving those facts in our mind into our heart. See if you can spot the key as we read the passage. I'm going to start reading Matthew 7, uh, starting in verse 24 to the end of the chapter. Jesus told his disciples these words. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down and the streams rose and the winds blew and beat against that house, yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. When Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were amazed at his teaching, because he taught as one who had authority and not as their teachers of the law. In this passage, Jesus talks about two different people. Each of them hears the words of Jesus. But only one of them puts them into practice and applies them in their life. And that's the key. When I studied in Israel many years ago, I traveled all over the country. That was part of the curriculum. We went to every part of the country, would study scripture passages and studied the historical geography and as it related to scripture and the events that, that were connected with that part of the country. And all over the country, you see these small valleys, and they're called wadis. Um, and in, in Jesus' day, uh, people often built their home in these wadis. But when there was a, a powerful storm, water would often come down from the mountains and, and flow into these wadis, into these small valleys. Sometimes if it, was, if it was a huge storm, it would almost create rivers going through these valleys. Um, and uh, in Jesus' day, people often built their, their home in a wadi because the ground was soft there. Um, and, you know, when, when that storm hit and a river would form, uh, what ended up deciding whether a house would stand or not was, what, you know, what the house had been built on. If it had been built on the rock or just on sand. Now, digging down to find the rock was hard work. But that's what often would have you know, kept a, a house from collapsing during a huge storm and, and then a river that created from that. And what is interesting is if, if you looked at both houses, you know, two different houses built on different foundations, from the outward appearance, they wouldn't look any different. The only thing was, would be different was with the foundation that they were laid on, which you couldn't see. And people wouldn't really reveal, you wouldn't understand where the, what the house was built on unless a storm had come to show the strength or, or the weakness of that house. And there's a parallel to that with Scripture because there's a theme in Scripture that says God often allows trials in our life or storms in our life, if we use this analogy. God, God will often allow storms in our life to, to reveal uh, the strength of our spiritual life. God often allows trials or storms in our life in order that we would increase our trust in the Lord and our faith in him during difficult times. And so the Sermon on the Mount ends in a typical fashion uh, in terms of Jesus' teaching because it ends in a a parable. I think in this parable of, you know, the the builders, the wise and foolish builders, uh, Jesus is talking about uh, two different Christians here. Uh, Both are members of the Christian community. Each of them hears the words of Jesus, um, but only one of them applies them in his life. And said, hearing the word of God is good, but according to this passage, it's not enough. We need to hear and obey in our life. This concept is repeatedly emphasized in different passages of Scripture. 
Turn with me to Romans chapter 2. Let me show you verse 13 in that chapter. Paul writes and says, For it is not those who hear the law who are righteous in God's sight, but it is those who obey the law who will be declared righteous. And then James, toward the end of the New Testament, writes with the same concept. Uh, and it really summarizes everything in verse 22 when he has, says, Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. So if all we do is listen to the word, we're deceiving ourselves. We're deceiving ourselves, being content with, with just facts in our mind. And then James goes on to, to illustrate verse 22. And he says, anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they've heard, but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. Then I think of one other parable that Jesus gave. Uh, he gave the parable of the, the seed and the sower, where the seed represents the word of God falling on different types of soil, which illustrates falling on different responses from people, and, and responses that you and I can have to the word of God in our life. And in that parable, it says, as the seed fell on the first three soils, it really made no lasting impact because of a person's heart or because of distractions in their life. But only when the seed fell on fertile soil, fell into a heart of a person who was ready to receive it and act on it, you know, was the result fruitful in their life. And so hearing God's word and hearing God's word and doing it, combining faith and action, is what uh, uh, leads to fruitfulness in our lives. It's like rowing with two oars of a boat. History records uh, there was a battle on the sea between the Greeks and the Persians. And for some reason during the, the course of the battle, both ships brushed up against one another. And the Greeks saw that coming and they pulled all of their oars inside the boat. But the Persians didn't do it. And all of the oars on one side of the Persian boat broke off. But the Persians didn't know it. So they kept rowing. But they were just rowing in circles. And the Greeks saw that. And, and the Greeks were able to quickly defeat the Persians. Because the oars had, were gone for half of their boat. And when we just listen to the word of God and don't do anything with it, it's as if we're rowing through the sea of life with one set of oars. Really, we're just going in circles in our life. And our spiritual life sometimes shows that. Howard Ball, who was the former director of, of a small group ministry called Churches Alive, he said, the problem with, with most Christians is that we are educated beyond our obedience. Making someone knowledgeable doesn't mean they were that, that they are obedient. And if you're a parent, you know what I'm talking about with children. Making them knowledgeable doesn't mean they're always obedient. And A.W. Tozer has written some helpful ideas here that talk about knowledge, truth, and the difference. He explains that knowledge are facts that inform. And when we apply those facts to our life, then it becomes truth. And so truth is really ap applied knowledge that transforms our life. And then Tozer in his writings says, when does truth, or when does knowledge become truth? He says, at the point of obedience. And that's the Hebrew understanding of knowledge. Greeks would understand knowledge as information in their minds. And that, that's why in Greece you have a lot great philosophers and, and people understand that. But the Hebrew understanding of knowledge is you take those facts and you experience them, you apply them in your life. So the Hebrew understanding of knowledge is, is, not, is information that you are, are experiencing. You're not just content with the facts in your mind. Great example of that are the Pharisees in Jesus' day. They were very knowledgeable about Scripture. They had a lot of information in their minds, but Jesus constantly criticized them because they didn't live out. They didn't apply. They didn't obey those Scriptures. 
in, in essence, he says, you don't really know those scriptures. They're in your mind, but you're, they're not, you're not living them out in your heart. You know, many of us know people, you may, we, uh, they may even be people, some in our families, uh, who were raised in church, who know about God, who, who are acquainted with Scripture, but they're not walking with the, the Lord today. Um, they know right and wrong. They know about Scripture, um, and yet they, they choose to disobey. And to be honest, we saw that in our son 15 or 20 years ago when we were living in Bakersfield and we got a call to, to go to Dinuba. We moved to Dinuba. We waited until our son graduated from high school. And then we moved to Dinuba. And he, he started school at, at Cal State Bakersfield. And uh, at that point, he made some choices that he knew were contrary to what we believed. He knew that they were contrary to what... Uh, was taught in scripture, but he was more influenced by his friends than, than really following after the Lord. Um, and at that point, let me ask you a question. Did our son need us to give him more information or quote verses to him to try to get him to change his life? No. We tried, but it just fell on deaf ears. His heart had become hard, hard at that point, if you want to use that, the analogy of of the parable of seed and sower. And so uh, at that point, uh, we simply began praying and, and loving him. Uh, his mother was, was more consistent in that than, than I was. Um, and I'm happy to say that, that our son has come back to the Lord. He and his, his wife and all of his four kids are very active in church. His wife is on staff at, at River Lakes Community Church active in children's ministry. And they're probably involved with church uh, four nights a week, uh, doing Awana or small groups. Or, you know, this morning she's leading you know, the, the preschool division at, in, in, uh, at the church. Um, and I just want to tell you, life is a lot more enjoyable when we get together with them. You know, we have many things in, in common. But you know what? If you look at Scripture, the Bible has many examples of of godly parents whose children chose not to obey the Lord. Um, and uh, at, you know, uh, at some point, uh, children have to become responsible for their own, own choices, regardless of, of how they were raised. Uh, sometimes in church, we are so quick to criticize parents whose children aren't walking with the Lord. And when we do that, uh, I think what we're really uh, showing is that we, we're very good Pharisees. We're quick to criticize the brother or sister whose kids may not be walking with the Lord. But I also think um, Christians often misinterpret a very well-known proverb found in the Old Testament. Proverbs 22.6, many of you could probably quote it. It says, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is older, he will not depart from it. You know how most Christians understand that verse? Most Christians think, and they've been taught this way, if I just give my ch child the right information, when he is older, he will obey it. But you and I have seen too many examples of, ch of parents who did that, and children are not walking with the Lord. Making somebody knowledgeable doesn't mean they're obedient, okay? Um, but here's, here's the key. The Hebrew meaning of that phrase, train up a child in the way he should go, doesn't just refer to knowledge. Train up a child in the way he should go refers to a child's personality and temperament. That's what we often don't understand. And if you've ever raised children and have more than one, you know every child is different. We're with my four grandchildren yesterday to celebrate Christmas. Every one of them is different. They've got a unique personality. Their temperament is different. Uh, you know, they're motivated by different things. They respond differently in, in every, uh, to different situations. It's like a, the quote I read from one man said, before I had children, I had six theories about raising kids. Now I have six children and no more theories. 
And that's what happens. You're raising it. They're all different, you know. With some, you can yell and scream, and they don't do anything. With others, you just give them a mean look, and they, they cower, you know. That's part of what this verse refers to. Train up a child in the way he should go, okay? And what that means is God's, God's word, God's truth doesn't change, but wise parents will use different methods and strategies with different children because that will help them, you know, um, that will help them learn. It's like planting seed in, in different types of crops and knowing how best to, to sow seeds using different crops. So as A.W. Tozer pointed out and asked the question, when does knowledge become truth? At the point of obedience. Let's apply some of this to some of these principles to our own lives. As we prepare to start a, a new year, often people will, will set out and make resolutions or, or goals or things that they want to do. As you think about starting a new year, uh, let me ask you a couple of questions. Do you have a plan to gain more knowledge of God? Now, that means regularly reading through the Bible. I know that there are people who read through the Bible in a year. Anybody do that? Okay. I don't. And years ago, I came to a point where I don't feel guilty about that anymore. Okay? To read through the Bible every year, you have to read three or four chapters every day and maybe five on every Sunday. And I think once in 2015, I did do it. Um, but I don't do it every year. Uh, and every year, I'll, I may set out a, a different goal. This last year, I decided to, to read through uh, Old and New Testament, and I alternate so I don't just get bored. Um, and I can t I'll, I'll tell you, in the Old Testament, I've read uh, from Genesis, and I'm almost, I'm finishing up Isaiah. And since I preached on Minor Prophets last year, I figured I'm good for that. Um, and I'll just, in the New Testament, I'm up, I'm up, I just finished Second Peter. So this week I will probably finish reading the New Testament. Um, but I, I have different plans as I read through Scripture. Uh, and to be honest, sometimes I'm reading through Scripture, and it's like, you know, I, I, I've, you know, God really speaks to me as I'm reading through a certain letter or, or a certain, certain book of the Bible. Uh, and God's really speaking to me. And sometimes God says, Jim, you need to spend the next two weeks just reading this every day. And I sit there and go, you know, that's going to really mess up my reading plan to, 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 to finish the Bible. And he says, that doesn't matter. You know, and sometimes God will say, you need to plant yourself here for the next month. And he, he did that years ago. He had me reading Ephesians and Philippians every day uh, for a month. And that's what sometimes... You know, God may challenge or encourage you, you know, as you're reading through Scripture, and God really speaks to you, and he says, why don't you just stay here a while, and let that word really soak into your, your heart and soul, you know, and, and so then I don't, that, that's when I stop feeling guilty for not reading through the, the entire Bible, but what is important is that if, even if I stop and focus on a couple books or a certain letter, your God is still speaking to me, and that's where he, he wants to plant me, and I encourage you to, to think about that, okay? So it's helpful having some type of plan. There are some people that don't have any plan. They just they sit there and go, well, I'll just, you know, where the Bible opens, I'll, I'll just read that. And it's, yeah, it's still God's word, but, you know, you may end up reading Leviticus 29, you know, or Song of Solomon. It may not be the most helpful for you that day, you know, so you need to have some type of plan. Another question is, do you have a plan? I mean, it, it's good to spend time in the Word, but do you have a plan to help you apply that knowledge, apply that, that information? You know where that best occurs? The place that helps you best apply what you're reading is if you're in a small group, you know? Whether it's in your home or whether it's here at church or, you know, during the week. If you're part of a small group that... They love you enough to ask you how you're doing spiritually. Um, that's re what really makes a difference. You know, there are some groups that focus just on knowledge, some focus on application. The best is really a combination of both. And what we're talking about is accountability. And accountability 
is the key to helping people obey. Um, loving people enough to ask them how they're really doing. Uh, you know, knowing people well enough to sit there and say, well, how are you doing in your spiritual disciplines? You know, or turning to them and say, um, as you read scripture last week, what did you learn uh, about your spiritual life? What, what did the Lord point out to you? Or sometimes asking, you know, uh, as you were praying last week, what did, you God, what did you hear God say to you? And maybe that, that implies another question. Do you ever spend time listening to the Lord as you're praying? Sometimes we think just pray, praying is talking to God. But praying is also listening to the Lord as you're praying. You know, and that's, that's part of it. You know, or if you know your spiritual gift or you're using it in ministry. And the closer you are with people, the more open and transparent you can be with one another. And you can ask each other questions about stewardship or evangelism or discipleship as a way of, of caring for them and encouraging them. Because if you're part of, a spirit, part of a small group where that's experienced, I want to tell you, it will transform your life. Because you'll be surrounded by people who love you and care enough about you to uh, encourage you to be accountable and be strong together. It's interesting, the last two verses of this chapter, the crowds had listened to Jesus teach and were told that they were amazed at his teaching. The Greek word literally means they were dumbfounded by what is teaching. And here's the reason. He taught as one who had authority and not like religious teachers of their day, which is a real criticism, I think, uh, of religious teachers. But what, what that means is that uh, religious teachers of his day really claim no authority of their own. Religious teachers of Jesus' day uh, felt their duty was, was to be completely loyal to the tradition that they had been given to them from the past. So their focus was on information that they had uh, been given that related to the past. Jesus came along and talked about God's word being uh, experienced in the present so that lives were transformed in the future. And instead of just focusing on past information, people looked at Jesus and who he was teaching and, and lives he was touching and seen lives transform, miracles being occurred and people responding to his teaching. That's what God desires for each of us. Not that we would just focus on information in the past, but that God's word, the knowledge would become truth that we experience, that we apply as, as we obey. Uh, and that's what God desires to see in our life. And when we do that, that's what makes our uh, Christian life uh, dynamic instead of dreary, satisfying instead of stagnant, and hopeful instead of uh, helpless. Uh, now, beginning, you know, if you don't have a regular plan of reading the Bible, this, is, this can be a very mysterious book, knowing where to start, uh, where to begin. Um, if you need any tips about that, then come see me, see one of the leaders or Pastor Roger. We can give you a few tips and guidance on what, is, where is, uh, what are helpful books to read uh, and what books... Uh, Hold off reading. Um, nice way to say that. That just would be some better. Okay? Uh, join me in a word of prayer. God, we thank you for uh, the word of God, the sword of the spirit, which is your word is like a double-edged sword that, that challenges, that encourages, that sometimes rebukes us, admonishes us, teaches us, and instructs us. Lord, May we be people of, of your word. May we be people, as we start this next year, that are committed to your word, but not just hearing your word, not just listening to it, but doing it and obeying it. May our knowledge become truth as we live out your truth and principles. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Let me invite you to stand for our final song as we close our service this morning. Why don't you stand with us? Take these hands I know they're empty But with you they can Be used for beauty in your 
perfect plan. All I am is yours. Take these feet. I know they stumble, but we use the Amen. Uh, let me just tell you that uh, when, when we conclude and you're dismissed to go into the social hall, uh, we have a number of uh, leftover cookies from the Christmas Eve service that we'd like you to finish this morning. Um, some of you may have uh, valued over eight yesterday, but we're sort of continuing that tradition, um, continuing to celebrate Christmas. Uh, we want to close with the benediction we've used for this sermon series, Matthew 5.16. Let's say this together, okay? In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Amen. May that be true. God bless you. You're dismissed. <laughs>